uh, destroyed too, but uh, it's not uh, from, destroyed from the, from the private investors and from the government, but it's not uh, destroyed in that case like, uh, like Berlin. I'd just like to add a few words of support to Senator um, Schumann, I think. Schumann. Yeah. Um, it's very hard for us in England to realize the extent to which ideology, modernism, and the new world order, call it fascism, call it communism, call it modernism from America, has afflicted German life over the last 40 years. Uh, the, the way in which the, the, the old vernacular national cost structures of towns were brutally torn apart by bombing and then by, you might say, a, a revamped version of modernism that came over from the Nazi past, split into two, went to the west, went to the east. And I was very struck indeed last year, and at the invitation of the University in Dresden, I went through all the building files of the Dresden City Council, recently made public for the first time, from 1945 until 1992, up to the 1989 uh, 90, up to the end of the TDR. I also went through all the Ausbau Ministerial, the Reconstruction Ministries, and um, documents, and uh, uh, you might say, circulars uh, that were sent down. And it's simply amazing to me that the degree of ideological rubbish that was that accompanied the instructions as to how to rebuild large cities like Dresden. And quite frankly, I can so understand the senator wishing to reconstruct Berlin in a civilized, rather more urbane way, because large populations, particularly in East Central Europe, are simply fed up to the teeth for 40 years of radical modernist experiments. They simply want to go back to Wrong or civilized form of life. Yeah. Thank you. It's true, however, let me say this. I mean, the, the Berlin does have also places where modernism is, is, is exquisite. I mean, the, bar, the hands of our history. Yeah. And there are pieces. It, we have to be very careful in, in, in making this. No. Uh, uh, Come to Dresden and see if you're. I know there's a bit of a set of oppositions. I mean, we, we, it's, it's. I would hate to see this Russian polarized between essentially historicism. And modernism, and modernism being painted at the end. Well, I'm not sure it's a discussion in there. It is in many ways, I'm sorry. As it's seen by many people in East Germany. Right. Uh, I'd like to carry that on with uh, the discussion on later. Uh, I think everybody might need a cup of coffee now. I'm going to bring the back at 12 o'clock. We're running about four an hour later. We'll come back at 12. Um, and Kelvin Campbell will talk about that. Okay. <laughs> He's still spoken about. But if I could just briefly summarize them, I don't want to go over work that Rob Scott uh, has been talking about. But basically, you've got uh, a channel from the coming in from. from this part of the world now. Crossroad across the middle, uh, the Jubilee Line, and. No, I can't see it. It's upside down. Sorry. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Tenslink, these longer routes that run all the way through, basically fo focusing on the work of Tenslink 2000 in the central area, um, crossroad across the middle, and the Chelsea Hackney line running across the top. Um, looking at, at road and rail infrastructure in London, these are all the things that are in the pipeline. In general terms, there's a movement towards bus uh, parking, parking in Australia, bus priority the red routes, traffic calming, special parking areas, and emission controls in London. These are all the recent, the recent uh, projects in the pipeline. In terms of rail, the DLR, Bank, Pepton, um, a number of projects, some that are still there, some that are finished, some that are still being spoken about. And then also a series of road improvement programs in, in, uh, in London, all, 
or pretty much underway. In terms of the short term, projects, once again, the pipeline looking for private sector funding for dear large innovation. Um, very well, more than my upgrade, and a series of other ones leading up to Heathrow Express and Croydon Light Rail. And of course, the East London River Crossing, which is still very much the project area I'm speaking about. Um, the medium term, Jimmy Line extensions in there, whether it happens or, or not, is still a matter of public debate. Um, Crossrail, Templing upgrade is now being dropped, and London Tilbury South being upgraded, it's only so about that. So there appears to be, at the moment, <coughs> about 22 billion pounds worth of committed projects, committed once again to the small C in the pipeline, none of which have political support or very clear political support. There's also the overlay of other things that are happening in London. Um, the city challenge areas, the DOE priority areas, ranging from Ealing Shatterbelt in, in, in West London, uh, which really focuses on the work that's been done around Park Royal. Uh, and then of course Stratford and East End's corridor that Rob um, Scott spoke about. Also work that's been done in the tributaries of the Thames. Um, works that work like the Wandle Valley, um, the Lee Valley, and um, Definite Creek. And also the public-private sector interest areas that um, in the pipeline as well. What we did is we looked at land availability in London. This was part of a rail-based development study program that we involved in, really taking the argument, if you can't take, if you can't take transport and development, you can't afford to take transport and development, how do you make best use of the existing transport infrastructure in London? And looking at the structure of London in terms of land availability, um, the predominant vacant or redundant bits of land appear to be focused largely on the west, um, areas around Park Royal Hillington, and on the east. Uh, with a couple of patches to the north and south. So those are where the, the large bulk of the large, large bulk of, uh, of land that, uh, or the land reservoir that exists at the moment. Um, in terms of, of areas, areas of change or zones of change, um, the West London corridor, really focusing on the West London line between Clapham Junction and Park Royal, once again, um, is an area that could be opened up with, with very little money, and it's something that could be turned on fairly quickly. Um, King's Cross to Angel Road, mainly looking at the work of the Tottenham, uh, the work around Tottenham Hill, um, the increased accessibility of a place like Tottenham Hill, and of course the outer London towns that um, we can all get to fairly quickly now with express services. Other, other areas that are emerging, places like the South Bank, really focused around the Jubilee Line extension, um, the North, Cir the North um, Circular Corridor, Stratford to Lewisham, with the DLR Lewisham coming in, and of course the Royals parking to Woolwich um, Link which I'll speak about a bit later. Um, and then in terms of planned infrastructure, the two main corridors that we've spoken about at the moment, East Thames Corridor and the Crossrail Corridor. So that's really a summary of the changing areas of London, or areas that are changing as a result of, um, of major transport proposals. <coughs> in the light of this, we put together this proposal of the CBI tra uh, Transport Task Force. Let me try and focus on that. which was termed London Short Circuit. I think London was suffering from um, an overabundance of big mega structural projects, all of, all of them costing between one and three billion pounds. Projects like Crossrail costing two and a half and increasing at that time. Um, the Channel Tunnel Railway, where at that stage there wasn't really much commitment, the government commitment to, to, to doing. And we came forward with the strategy of saying, if we unbundle projects, if we just looked at them as good bits of infrastructure, um, and we perceive them as good, good bits of links, or good links, how could we change the nature? Ultimately, we want to get to what all these projects want to, want to achieve in London, but how, how do we get there? And the structure here was to say, um, developing around the idea that sooner or later you want to get to Europe, uh, at least get the high-speed rail link through to Dartford. And at that stage, the Dartford International Station is roughly over there, now over here down at Ebb Street. And then how do you make good use of existing um, infrastructure by just building little bits. So Woolwich Rail Link was an option, possibility of routing channel tunnel trains in the short term along there until you finally got the, the bigger picture in. But you could slowly build up your argument in incremental bits and you wouldn't wait for these big mega structural projects to happen. Other projects, what happens if Crossrail disappear? There's viable Crossrail routes or Cross London routes that just need to be put in place, just making use of, of existing lines. Once again, it's just a management problem. Um, there's a viable north-south crossrail link, which is the West London line, which I spoke about a bit earlier, really only costing 15 million pounds to put in place. 
compare that to the first payment that the community will bank to make on the Jubilee line to, to drop the notion. Um, other, other projects, like what happens if the Jubilee line um, doesn't happen? I don't think we can put Jubilee line on here. Um, there's services that can do what, what Jubilee line wants to do. And the argument was put forward that if we, if we identify smaller bite-sized chunks, if the agenda is to attract the private sector into funding these projects, they're not going to be looking at two and a half billion pound projects. They're going to be looking for one to two hundred million pound projects. So things like what is rarely, which is only a hundred million pound project, compared to, say, four or five billion of the total picture. It's really a drop in the ocean. Taking this a step further, um, we were appointed by London Transport Planning and the LDDC to look at an incremental strategy for linking the Royal Docks to Woolwich as part of a, as part of a bigger picture. The main problem with the, Royal, the, the Isle of Dogs and the Royals is they always look to London, whereas two thirds of London's commuters are coming from the southeast and they're great towns, and there's very few jobs done in this part of the world. Also, if you look at the characteristics of this corridor, which is all within the control of, of boroughs that have got their UDPs up and running and they've got their, their, their own development aspirations there, they're all bite sized chunks of land or bite sized um, pieces of infrastructure that are needed to, to improve this. So you're looking at a place which is a changing town center around Dartford, a, a declining town center in Woolwich, mainly because of the closure of Woolwich Arsenal, which is the biggest redundant building in Europe at the moment. The fact you can't get anything off the ground in the Dartford at the moment. You've got a declining town center up at Stratford, another declining town center up at Dalston, and of course, driven by the other King's Cross development at the other end. So potentially, by making use of existing infrastructure or existing rail corridors, by just changing the nature of the service, you can slowly open up areas in an incremental way. The idea being that these things are affordable. You don't need a, um, uh, a new mechanism, a new um, regeneration agency. They can all be done by the local authority working together. And it would be achievable. We wouldn't have to wait for, for the big picture to happen all the time. <coughs> Also looking at the current land use strategies around, around there, um, fairly obviously there were changes to the planning policy guideline, particularly work that's been done on um, PPG 13, which is about changing our attitudes to, to mobility. Do we have to build all this infrastructure? Can't we just take the jobs to where the people are rather than taking the people to the jobs all the time? So it had a fundamental effect on, on how we plan, how we do things, how we integrate land use with, with, with transport planning. The other sorts of broad areas that were happening, uh, the King's Cross project, the Dalston Town Centre project, the work around Tottenham Hale, all stuff that happened along this sort of corridor. The work in Stratford that's been undertaken recently, um, largely focused on um, the, the Channel Tunnel Terminal, and uh, the work in Canning Town. Of course, the Royal Docks, which you spoke about a bit earlier, which is probably the biggest redundant regeneration site, with massive, um, uh, inf uh, massive, massive costs involved in, in infrastructure development. Uh, the Woolwich Arsenal that I spoke about before, the redundant building and the changing town centre. Thames Me, which has never been finished, you know, infrastructure sitting in the ground that's, that's, that's cost us many years ago. Um, we just haven't finished it. We focus on other bigger projects. We haven't potentially haven't had too many fronts. Um, also, Dartford, if, if Dartford's been touted as the meal um, of, of the East Thames corridor, why are they putting the station at Edge Street, which is about 30 miles down the road? Um, the French put their TGB station right into the middle of the year. We try desperately hard to miss everything. And in missing everything, we don't have a service anymore. And then finally, the East Thames Corridor, which is the other major policy, um, uh, set of policies that have been developed at the moment. Um, looking at the network uh, that exists in this area, the place is, is fairly well connected to central London, but you can see this large, it's largely dominated by these radial routes, very few north-south connections, which is very much the predominant problem in this part of the world. When it comes to north of the river, the place is, is better connected, better access to, to rail and, and uh, tube services. The strategy that is put forward is really, once again, based on the incremental approach. Um, if we got the link in, which would only cost 100 million. How could we slowly change the location of stations? It's really from a million pounds a shot to, to move some of these stations. They're really, majority of them, quite small buildings. And putting them in the place where they serve the, serve the local area better, introducing one or two other stations like Thames Road over here. 
um, introducing the possibility of rail park and ride to make use of redundant sites in the short term. So people come to this area. So you start attracting, you start sucking people to this corridor rather than, um, as in the case of the Thames Mead Town Centre, individual centres trying to compete with others. But the idea is just trying to develop a, um, a fully integrated transport corridor that people could, could be attracted to and could, could get directly to their points of destination in central London. And the, the beauty of this kind of approach is that you're not, you're not locked into a single system. And you, can, you can make your choice at places like Stratford to go in different ways, which is completely different to something like Crossrail, which is in the standard on the surface, plus being once again two and a half billion pounds. Also looking at the nature of these centres, I mean, each of them perform in slightly different ways. Um, some of them function as strategic centres, based on, say, Stratford. Some of them focus as, or some of them perform as, as, as major shopping, uh, shopping, uh, shopping centres, the villages and uh, the Dartfords. Some of them focus as, as local centres, some of them are close to the river. And each of them are diverse in their own particular way. What we were trying to do here, to try and examine the ways in which each, each of these centres could perform and either com complement or supplement um, one another. And the idea was that just with small bits of tampering and small, small local action, you could actually achieve a corridor without waiting for the grand plan. <clears throat> if I could touch on Crossrail, that's probably the most contentious one. I know there's been discussion, but I think there's an announcement, an announcement made last night that there's finally some form of government support for it. The real beauty of a, of a project like Crossrail is that it takes pressure off the centre. I think London's, London suffered from too much central place. Uh, it's very much a dominant centre. Um, if this hadn't been an American city, we would have seen the M25 locations and the slow decline in the centre. All that's really happened is that the pressure in London has been dissipated by people jumping on the other side of the green belt, so places like <coughs> and over, um, have all taken the load, taken the brunt of, um, of, of expansion of the, of, of the centre. All of a sudden, Crossrail comes along and potentially provides an east-west corridor, um, introducing an animal which is um, distinctly different from many other types of services. Firstly, it's a cross-railway, a cross-city link, uh, which we don't have in the Thames that operates in the Bottle region. Secondly, it links our two major engine rooms at the moment, Stratford and Park Royal, the largest area in London where they saw reasonable manufacturing, and the potential of opening up Stratford, which is, which is also pretty well connected. Um, in real terms, a place like Tottenham Court Road is only 10 minutes away from Park Royal. Now, my understanding of Park Royal is it's, it's about an hour away from central London and also very difficult to get to. Uh, the possibility of Crossrail opening up the Ealing Shuttlebelt area, to make reference to John Sheen Cambridge's description of that sort of wounded bit of the city, and of course it potentially could link into the East Thames Corridor if it wasn't seen as the standalone system. In other words, it was seen as a network that extended beyond here and did other things. So the importance of Crossrail really is, is one of the few opportunities for us to take the pressure off the centre and dissipate it in some sort of linear urban form across, across the centre. And for the first time we start speaking about corridors, I think we spoke about centres for years, and uh, all our planning logic was dominated by a centre. We used the centre almost everything. It was a local centre or a shopping centre. And all of a sudden we now talk about corridors, which are distinctly different in nature. <coughs> um, I'll briefly go through some work that we'll be doing on Tottenham Court River Station. It's, um, when you put something like a crossrail station into the fabric of, of London, in this instance, uh, an area which is, which is bounded by the Soho, the Bedford Square area where we are at the moment, um, another conservation area up in Monrovia, and this, another, another wooded bit of the city, which is largely as a result of some road wide road changes that happened um, around about the turn of the century. Um, also, also, a bit of the city has been wounded by the base of centre point. Uh, if you sort of summarise the two major transport problems in London, they have to be the Hammersmith Gyratory and the centre point directory. And the blight that that puts on that part of the world, and also the full stop that it puts on, on Oxford Street, is, is enormous. It's only when you start looking at pedestrian flow, pedestrian figures, do you realise how, how powerful it is at arresting any, any possible expansion and any further development of, of Oxford Street bomb on that part of the world. Also, in international terms, we're looking at the international shopping street for clothing, the international shopping street for um, books, international street for theatre, Shaftesbury. And so in world terms, 
these, these places are recognized. They're solid brand names. They're like Savile Row or uh, Via Benito. You, know, you don't need to sell these places anymore. But the unfortunate part is the struggles to local authority boundaries, Camden and Westminster, who don't talk to one another at all. Um, in fact, we went to a meeting where we were told not to tell anyone that their offices were both in the same, the same meeting. <laughs> Summarize of London. Right? Um, anyway, into this emerges a crossrail station, which has the effect of multiplying the pedestrian flows around Centre Point by five times. That's the fabric, as we know it. Um, this is the strange, messy bit, the strange, messy sector over there, which is quite loose. The grain's fairly tight on those three quarters. Uh, but this is an area that is dominated by 1930s and 1950s buildings. Large sites, um, a lot of them in, are coming to the end of their, their shelf life. Um, we were instructed by the St. Giles Landowners Association and the DOE, London Region, in this instance, to come up with a strategy to see how the station could contribute to the regeneration of the area. It's a fairly wide brief, but um, an interesting one. That's the fabric of the area at the moment. It's dominated by Centre Point. Tinpan Alley, Charing Cross Road down here, Soho, Soho Square, a couple of, you know, very tight fabric. It's not going to change, no one's going to let it change very much. Um, but applies to the rest as well. <clears throat> That's the nature of the area in terms of its land uses. I mean, everything that London does best seems to come together in this place. Um, fashion, TV, media, design, um, its hotels, advertising, the restaurants of Greek Street, the first street. The new age area, covered garden, the furniture patch over there, and the pedestrian flows, and they're almost dying completely from then onwards. Very difficult to get to work from there onwards. And if you start looking at the themes of the area, that's the area that appears to be the loosest in terms of, of what its identity is. <clears throat> in terms of accessibility, very well connected, um, notwithstanding the fact that Crossroads is going to happen. Uh, proposals for Chelsea Hackney Line running through the middle. Crossrail on Oxford Street, showing the train crossroad, Tottenham Court Road. Um, once again, those, those sort of strange, perverse traffic patterns that exist. Um, bus only, bus and taxi only down Oxford Street, um, car, general traffic, which is yellow, and the sort of funny gyratory that uh, works in a, in a reverse way. And that's what happens underground. This be the biggest rabbit warren, and it's bigger than that now. Um, Crossrail stations are 300 meters long, three football pitches long. Chelsea Hackney, which could become a metro rail type service, which means that exactly the same amount of, of, um, of underground development would happen. In other words, those stations would extend from there to about there now. Um, the Astoria Tech Hall, Dean Street Tech Hall. And really, that's what London's going to be like for five years if it's all in a state of flux building that. For that five years if it goes ahead. Um, that's the nature of this part of the world, a normal weekday, that's the pedestrian activity of that part. And in the midst of this, um, we're looking at this, this site, next, next slide is about this site over here. Crossrail decide to put their station. That's Michael Hopkins' scheme, the main entrance on the corner. Um, as I said, five times the amount of pedestrians in the area coming out. Uh, people emerging possibly from Stratford at uh, an international train stop. 80% of all passengers, I believe, will go up to Stratford and make their way to the west end of the city, but that's their final point of destination. So everyone emerging with their backpacks and maps and stuff trying to find their way around London will be emerging on that corner. <coughs> but Crossroad has belief that someone else's problem. You know, it's, uh, we, bring, we bring people here, someone else solves them. Uh, we came up with a series of strategies for closing, for closing the gyratory. Um, mainly looking at uh, putting cent putting Centre Point back into back into the into the mainland and opening up a, a new public space in front of Centre Point. We've also asked to take a perspective, a 20-year perspective, on what might happen for the future of Centre Point as well. And these are all a range of different um, options, looking at providing a fully integrated um, transport interchange with buses and uh, pedestrians opening up, pedestrians entering London onto a public space of some sort. Um, these were the sites that were in flux. I mean, it must be a fairly unique situation to find all four corners on a major, um, major intersection in London with planning applications in some form or other. Uh, major sites coming up for 
redevelopment over here on Shaftesbury. Um, space that needed to be mended by the back of um, what's known as the Phoenix Park area. And in the midst of this, this idea of Grand Central Station started emerging. This idea that you could make a bigger station on the on a baggy quarter. Um, in this instance, retaining centre point. And these were put forward as conceptual ideas to basically to try and retain that site over there, and move the station across to this quarter. And I think this is very much the, the preferred option at this point in time, I believe. Um, other than the possibility of, of, um, of mending a whole lot of buildings, there were proposals for large book stores, there were proposals for travel centres. Um, the theatre agreed to stay, there was a, a hotel planning application on the theatre that agreed to stay in that area, providing they could get a much bigger tower across the back. So all the themes that started coming back to the area, the idea of theatre and the idea of, um, of all the things that, like, as I said, this part of the world does best are coming, coming back in some form or other with the possibility of the station then being located on that site with an entrance onto the public square in that sort of location. And then taking a larger or longer term view of what might happen to Centre Point. Um, the Centre Point is squashed down into a lower rise building, you can open up that into a much bigger public space. And those were very much the ideas that were put forward to, um, to the clients of the DOE as a possible strategy for regeneration. Um, this extended to beyond um, the site, it extended to a very large site that I pointed out a bit earlier. Um, the proposals for a major arena of some sort. Um, I'll touch on another thing. Uh, most, most road and rail proposals in London at the moment are funded for negative reasons. Generally congestion relief or road safety. There's very few positive things happening, other than I suppose the Channel Tunnel Railing, which is probably a positive one. But your funding always comes through problems. It never comes through, through something positive. It never comes through the vision. End. And one of the most negative things to possibly come to London are the red routes. This idea of turning high streets into, into many motorways. Um, a place like Regent Street figures as a the red route, top and fourth road figures as a red route. The essence of these places is the ability to be congested. That's the stop stuff. The last thing we're going to do is take congestion away. This place is thriving congestion. Um, I hope they'll be dropped soon. You know, the intention is to extend these throughout London. And basically, they see as the cheap motorways to move traffic as much as possible. There's a strong belief that all they do is generate more traffic. They won't really solve the problems. I think we have the most over-controlled, over-managed public realm in the world. Uh, as a pedestrian, you're told exactly where to cross. You know, I think it's actually an insult. Um, someone did a comparison recently between a, a strip, of, strip of highway in front of a a couple of houses over a pub or houses over a shop. I think there were 60% more regulations in the highway than there were in the, in the, in the buildings. Anyway, if we were talking about the island city, and um, it's something that we've been talking about for some time. If you if you really took a view of what the city, what structures the city and what it wants to be, um, too much of it is is dominated by this kind of thinking. I'm sorry, I borrowed this from Richard Rogers' Shanghai plan, which uh, is a perfect transport plans plan. This yeah. idea of a center, a series of centers, and a series of sub-centers, and a series of radial links, all of which tend to dissipate the structure of the city. Um, we start asking, asking the questions about what happens in the stuff between and how, how they function. But I think the structure of London is largely dominated by that kind of thinking. There's an obsession with finishing the North South Circular. I think there should be box keys with a road, uh, they don't need it, quite frankly. Um, there's this obsession with finishing rings. There's, we talk about orbital railways, we talk about round things, we talk about centers all the time. If you, if you let the let cities de develop in, in an ecological way, they really respond to, to, to transport patterns. And what we suggest is that if Crossrail ran across London in the right direction, or this Union Metro proposal, or the British Railway, you could possibly start getting this, this linear urban form extending from Uxbridge down to Dartford. But it's all done in a different way. And this is our attempt to say this is the alternative to centrality. Thank you very much.
Worthington, who is our next speaker, is uh, the Professor of Architecture at York University, chairman, chairman of DEGW, yeah. deputy chairman of DEGW, and uh, is a patron of the Urban Design Group. Uh, John will now talk about offices, office futures, where and what implications this have, has for London where they're likely to go, if they're likely to go anywhere, or whether it's all in our minds, whether it's part of the corridor scenario, or part of the central scenario, or the dispersed scenario. I'm just going to take a leaf out of Alan's book, actually, and also reflect a bit on Berlin, because I think I've been lucky enough to spend some time actually thinking about Berlin as well, uh, in terms of originally a, job, a competition we did for the site in Vedding, more recently in Rummelsberg, where we've been uh, working there. Uh, and an interesting piece of work I did for the Biomonasterium on what would be the impact of regulations on offices and where office designs and types of offices in Germany really going to be constrained by planning. And I'll touch on that as well because it might be interesting. Um, I also want to look back a bit uh, to the 80s uh, and to two key projects I was involved with. One was Broadgate and the other was Stockley Park, because I hear these as two kind of totems uh, which were discussed a lot when I go to Germany, and particularly Berlin, so it might as well be worth looking at them a little and reflecting, now we stand uh, a third of the way through the 90s, what those all meant, because I think it would be a bit of a disaster if we look back purely to the 80s and said we can recreate what we learned in the 80s back in Berlin in the 90s. And Berlin and East Germany and West Germany have a wonderful opportunity, I think, in fact, to look forwards rather than to necessarily look backwards. So let's start. Can you um, sort those out? And make them a bit bigger if they'll go. Um, piece of work we did, which is on the left, on the changing city, which really is actually uh, the city in the 80s, but I must say uh, I keep on reflecting on, on what are going to be one of the major drivers of the 90s, and I think it really is telecommunications. I was fascinated uh, by the images that Alan put up and the image of what really blew the early 19, uh, 18, 19th century city apart, which was the railway. Now actually we've got something else which is blowing apart the city, but you can't actually see it. And that's telecommunications and information technology. It's a difficult thing to get your arms around, uh, but it really is changing the way we think about work and living and ultimately what our cities are going to look like. Um, first of all, it's creating a new breed of workers, the knowledge worker. The added value of our products now is not in <coughs> the making of the hardware, it's in the design of that hardware, it's in the application of that hardware, it's the knowledge worker. Uh, and that is a vastly growing marketplace. Uh, and so we're really talking about the environment for that knowledge worker. We're also now talking about project-based work rather than uniform sort of work and we're talking about teamwork and group work uh, and in fact our information technology is reflecting that. You've all heard I guess about the concept of groupware, the ability now as we network our computers to work as groups, not even in one place, to start to actually shift work on a 24-hour cycle uh, around between continents and I think that is something we've got to be more and more aware of. We're interested now, actually, not just in managing space, but also time. Time is an element we find it hard to get our minds around, but it's absolutely critical. Uh, take BA, for instance, somebody I know quite well. Uh, if you've got a BA office in Atlanta in the States, when that to become 6.30 at night, they don't actually then have expensive night workers. They simply switch any require inquiries there are across into Newcastle and Glasgow where they've got a teleworking set, uh, telesales centres and where of course you've now hit 
uh, the prime time in terms of the time which is a, a, a reasonable time for people to work. So we can do that. We can actually shift work through time. And that's having a huge impact. So there's some really fundamental things happen, coupled with an information, with a technology now, which has become disengaged from the building. Remember the 80s, we were always very concerned about all this wires and machinery and heat, which is giving us problems in our buildings. Well now actually, with the modem, with the, the palm top computer, with the mobile phone, we've begun to break all those those requirements down. We're moving <coughs> from departmentally organization to project organization, from vertically structured to horizontal networks, not with all sorts of layers. One layer is really what organizations are authoritarian to much more collegial. I'm uni using a university term there. Much more uh, from an alienated workforce. And all those issues we are worrying about blue collar versus the white collar worker are really evaporating with our new knowledge worker to really people who are getting much more engaged in their work because basically you've lost all that hierarchy of people managing other people, supervising them. We're all actually managing ourselves. I think this is very fun. From simple tasks to very complex tasks. It's a bit of a historical image on the right but an important one. It was basically talking about that there is not one marketplace. Organizations vary, and they don't just vary at any one point, they're, they're changing through times. You can typecast organizations in terms of the speed of change and the type of work they're doing. So a very low change routine work is something like my local tax office, or a very high rapid change non-routine non -routine work is a young electronics company like Apple was. It's changing as well. And of course what happens is organizations then stay static. My tax office is in fact, as it automates more and more of the dreary jobs, becoming more non-routine, rapid change. So in terms of marketplaces and what we're trying to design for, we can't simply say there is one uniform market. We can't simply say there's one uniform market which I can predict into the future. What you're actually talking about is a dynamic set of users who are continually changing through time. Very important in terms of what we're doing about the city. The other thing which is happening is in terms of time, because we're not now doing one job seven hours in the day, but we're doing lots of different functions, and we're actually doing it in small chunks of time. We're coming to the office, we spend some time maybe in a group meeting, a little time at our desk, another in-house in office meeting, a little more time at our desk. So actually in total, we've got a quite a small time at our desk. In fact, we're probably spending also a good deal of time actually out at other people's offices as well or other areas. The concept probably will be that we'll spend some time maybe doing an hour's work at home in the morning. How many of us actually do that? I'm sure quite a number. We want a bit of quiet, we sit at home and do something. I mean, in the car, we're doing different sort of work or, or sitting together on a train. Uh, we come into the office, we go off somewhere else. It, it's a continuous muddle of places we're working in. That photograph of the right is interesting. It's Arthur Anderson, in fact, in London, who we're doing some interesting work for, where, in fact, people don't own their own desks because they're out so much of the time. They share desks. And we're looking, in fact, at an office that you might have put 150 people into, you can now get the equivalent of 250 people. In fact, there's an extreme version of this where they say can, they could squeeze the space by seven times. It'll never happen, but it's the sort of thing. What does that mean for the real estate market? Because I remember walking around Berlin and people saying there's going to be this huge demand. Take that. And take another example, take what's happened to the telecoms industry. British Telecom moving from 80 million square feet of space to 40 million square feet of space. Halving its space requirement. Not because it's reducing in terms of people, but it's reducing in terms of the technology. The technology is having a dramatic effect on what its requirements are. 
And I can go on and on and on in terms of the different sectors, which we know quite well now, in terms of what it's going to do in terms of space. OK, it's actually going to change the way we use space as well. You might think, Christ, what's this Star Wars thing on the right? That's, in fact, digital in Finland, where they themselves decided, why the hell do we need a normal sort of space if we're out most of the time? Actually, it's a club we need when we come in and change in, exchange information. What we'll do is make a relaxed place. And in fact, you can see in terms of actual use of the workplace, it's used very little, actually. It's used something like about 40% of the time, uh, actually, at any reasonable requirement. So why actually does everybody need their own desk? There's other ways you can actually organize the space. And there's a number of offices now just doing that. I want to look at Broadgate, because we hear a lot about it, and I think there are some good lessons. I want to look pre-1980, and I want to reflect a bit on post-1990. Well, before the 80s, we had an anti-white collar policy, if you'll remember. There was very much the office development permits retaining, restraining uh, office development in the center. We had the concept of the Office Locations Bureau to send people out to the periphery. We had a very difficult planning process, and we had growing conservatism. And in fact, you had sites like uh, this site, uh, which Beerbrief Rail owned, which was Broad Street and Liverpool Street, uh, which there were ideas for redeveloping it, but nothing really happened. We then, in the early 80s, had a major pressure for change. It was a deregulation of the financial services businesses. In fact, what we're now seeing, of course, is interesting, a deregulation of the information technology businesses, i.e. telecoms, which is actually probably going to have equally big as impact in different sorts of ways, but we haven't really figured out what that is. So you saw globalization, information technology coming in, deregulation of the final financial services, and a Europeanization, a sense that we were now a European city rather than a local city. And that's what we had, and that's in fact what we've got there now, about six million square feet of space. Before, two railway stations, an unrealized potential I would suggest, a city service area, few stable jobs around, and the shifting population in partially occupied buildings. It was actually, if you all remember that area, it was really the city fringe. We've now, I think, got a much better railway station. We've definitely got a new focus for the city. We've got somewhere between 15 and 20, 15 and 20,000 jobs. We've got, interesting enough, the major financial services, but a lot of the secondary services, have actually been moved right out. And I think this is one of the big disadvantages. And it's been pretty successful. I think one of the reasons it's successful is we did actually spend a long time really thinking about what the real users require. And I would suggest that anybody who's going to go in for something like this, and Berlin, I think, is in the same position, really needs to try and understand what the demand is all about. And this was done, in fact, by talking to a lot of people. And it came up with a very specific set of building, actually. The need for, because you had larger organizations, uh, much bigger footprints, uh, bigger foot, uh, buildings, and more need to carry services. It's very much what the 80s were about. It was what I would suggest is a modified North American plan. The North American tower block would have had a central core here in Broadgate. We had, in fact, cores at the edge, leaving a clear space with not too deep with air, light coming through the middle. Uh, interesting to compare it with the European version, or maybe the pre-1980s building, much narrower, full of columns. Interesting here, the NMB Bank in Holland which is much more about creating small group spaces, but then still maybe only eight meters at the maximum from any natural light here and in this courtyard here. 
And there it was very much built around what I just said. Appropriate to its time. Very appropriate, but of course, things are changing. It's also interesting to compare it with other cities. I think, in fact, at this scale, and I'm sure Berlin will have the same sort of flagship developments, you need to think about it in that universal, that global relationship. I, I put a quite strange collection, but I think all appropriate. You've got, in fact, Oslo, the Akibruka, mixed use, interesting. The only real one which really gets, I believe, very nicely, a uh, mix of residential entertainment, retailing, and office space working quite well at a very different scale, as you can see by that height. Uh, the one which is rather well known, of course, in Germany, uh, the uh, Messeturm in Frankfurt, a pretty stupid building, I would argue. Uh, because of its depth <laughs> and very uneconomical, Canary Wharf and finally Broadgate. Uh, and I think you can look at these in a variety of different ways. But there are some real lessons to be learned, I think. An underestimation of just how rapidly the market could change. I mean, you went set by with this tremendous enthusiasm. As we all do again, by the way, we keep on doing this every time something happens without looking behind us all the time. And I think that's very important. And one of the things I admire about Berlin is, in fact, you're taking your time. You're not being hustled uh, by the marketplace necessarily. And I think that's excellent. I think that's something to applaud as we get into these increasingly speedy times. Uh, a timid retail mix, pathetic actually, really, it's all one use. It's better than most places, uh, but it's still pretty timid. It's not at all integrated with the surrounding areas. As I said, in fact, the opportunity of creating a secondary market for services which support the primary services was really lost. And it's a great pity, and I did some work on that. And I think it's absolutely essential to get that rich mix. Uh, and it's hard, really, to create world-class architecture. You really have to work for it. I think that's it very important to realize, actually. The pressures against getting the best uh, are considerable. Uh, so those are the kind of things I think we want to watch out for. I want to look at another site, and the reason I want to look at one which is on the periphery, because I find fascinating about Berlin, is of course it's a city which both has a core and a periphery. But the trouble is they're owned by different authorities. Because you had, in fact, not just an outer ring road, but you've got an outer railroad, a rail system running around Berlin. And I loved, actually, some of the images that um, Calvin showed us, because I think there's a real story there to think about. I do believe you will see cities breaking down and into very intense places around excellent points of transportation. But so those will be both in the center and at the periphery. I don't think we will get this totally centralizing effect. Uh, and I think Stockley, although it doesn't have a railway station, it could easily have a railway station, it is one of these kind of places which is potentially built around both green field and being close to a transportation node. It's in fact built on a, a piece of rubbish tip, uh, and I think it's quite exceptional the kind of end environment it has got. And it also tried to understand both uh, the, the site itself as a commercial entity and also its relationship to the neighborhood around. Not so much physically, but in terms of the economic relationship. Much better, I think, than in some ways um, Broadgate managed to do. Again, very much based on thinking about what people wanted. We ran about 12 major uh, discussion groups and really tried to tease out from the sort of users what their requirements were. But I think there was another most important thing, and that was actually its reflection of time and how people change through time. And I would think this diagram is extremely important, actually, in terms of cities. That a, a successful piece of urban center, urban periphery, is going to be about getting the mix of all these stages in the life cycle of a firm. Uh, and in fact, I think Stockley did, to a certain extent, lose out there, that it didn't build sufficient 
of the space for these sorts of people, who actually in five years' time are rapidly changing into those and even into those. And the great thing you find about these developments as you go for these million plus square feet developments is they feed up themselves. They become entities if you get all the pieces right, if you get the cheap space and the expensive space, the small bits of space and the big space together. And I don't think in either Broadgate or Stockley did we really achieve that. I won't dwell on this, apart from actually the interesting thing about Stockley, you genuinely created a new building type, uh, and it was very much to, uh, related around telecommunications again. Big problems though, it doesn't have public transport, and it shows it. You know, you can see the kind of impact of everybody driving to work, and I'm delighted actually again when I start to do things in Berlin, uh, that there's a great concern not to rely just on getting there and hold on to that. I think it's very important. <coughs> I think what's interesting is if we're thinking about what sort of building, we've got to get a balance between four things. If you look at the, north, the, the, the northern European building, it's very much swiveled towards user values, use values. Building buildings around particular organization requirements. Very typical. In, in, in Germany, in fact, many of those uh, user-driven buildings are very, very particular. If you come to the UK, the buildings swivel exactly the other way and they're driven around exchange value, investment value. Very simple, almost crude, entirely about being totally flexible for anybody and maybe nobody and what can sell on the market. You go to something like Lloyd's Corporation in London or the Messer term, which is driven around image value. And I think actually what we're looking for is a balanced view between that, that, a little of that, and the business's requirement. How does it deal with information technology? And I think we have not yet really found that building form which is going to be very interesting. And in fact, that's exactly the form that I believe Berlin is after, and I hope we're going to be after in London when we start building again, which is going to be a fair time, I think. Uh, but it's got to be something we've got to actually get our mind around. <coughs> but you do have a kind of hang-up in Germany, and that is that no building's wider than 12 meters wide, uh, and it's all got little offices and a central corridor down the middle. Not entirely, there are some things happening. There's the idea you uh, managed to import from Scandinavia, the Combi office, which is very, very, very reflective of what I've been talking about, about not one job you do, but working as teams interrupting. Where in fact, what you do is you spread, you split the space, you say, each individual wants a little, very quiet place to work, but he only needs a tiny space to work, only maybe six square meters a person, <coughs> a tiny little monk cell. And then you turn the open plan inside out. You put all the meetings and interactive places in the middle, which is where you come and do the interactive type of work. So you split the workplace. Very, very different from this central corridor building and that central corridor building, with lots of little individual offices. And I think that's quite interesting. That is a, a form which is beginning to emerge in Berlin, but of course, not very easy to do if you've gone and built acres and acres, or hectares and hectares, of 12 meter deep space. Now, what people always say to me, ah, but we can't build anything else because that's what the regulations say. But so I think actually what you've probably got to think hard about is going a little bit deeper, thinking about the continuity of the space, certainly thinking hard about the location of the cause, and beginning to think about a mixture of open and enclosed. And I do actually find the Grünen Yard building in Hamburg interesting, and it reflects on our ground scapers in, in London, where you've really created, although very narrow, but you've created a rich integration of space, a real chunk of the city within the city, and the combination of uses, 
with the deeper workshop space on the ground floor and the more individual uh, office space above, and something like about two or three hundred different businesses all within that Grunin Yard empire within there working along the streets. I think there's a, a real lead from a building like that. When I think about are the regulations going to get away in, Ger in the way in Germany, do you know what actually gets in the way is the expectation of what the workers are going to say, not the planning itself. As I looked at it, it wasn't the planning regulations which got in the way, you had a good deal of flexibility. Actually, the problem was is the worry what happens when I get to negotiate with my users and the workers' council comes in, which isn't so much legal as what it comes to through the workers' councils. And I think that's the real issue, that you have to change perceptions of what work might be. I also think it's very interesting, of course, uh, that potentially innovation is not easy to do in Germany because here, yeah, whilst planning is discretionary, you can do all sorts of things. You can't go and negotiate early on. In Germany, as I understand it, you go quite a long way down the line before you then go and actually get planning permission for certain. So you've actually done quite a lot of drawings. And you can go and negotiate, but it's much more administrative in process. And you've got to have a nerves of steel, or your client has, to be prepared to go out and negotiate that. And the easy way out where you get an interesting architect and a boring client, and the client says, oh no, I can't do that, I might be get running into risk. You know, so that seems to me the real issue. So, what's the agenda for, I think, debate in Germany? Just thinking. I think we've got to talk about building regulations and innovative design, and I actually don't think that building regulations do get in the way. There's an obviously debate about living and working coexisting to provide a creative environment. But by the way, they needn't necessarily be literally living and working and you always live where you work. I don't think that's true. That doesn't need to happen, I don't think. Uh, I think we've got to think about the 1990s in terms of the appropriate form. I think, think much harder about planning brief related companies, real estate, and community interests. And finally, urban design concepts also must be related back to user needs and not just pretty lines on paper. And I think that's very important. So I would really sum up with those two options, and they're obviously extreme. Are we going to be lots and lots of people working that way, or how far is that going to influence? And I put four, five issues down. I think there's a very interesting issue in Germany, particularly Berlin, the balance between investors' concerns and users' interests, which is going to be critical. Locational characteristics, the balance between city center, city fringe, absolutely critical and going to be very interesting. And difficult to do in Berlin in some ways, because you have uh, the Old East and you have Berlin, it's going to be interesting. The concept of the healthy economic community, getting all those steps on what I call the premises ladder, and how do we actually get that richness of small firms alongside big firms. Nobody's really achieved it. Berlin certainly could. Uh, and finally, achieving that vision. My experience of having worked on uh, competitions in Berlin, there's a great deal of thinking about what the image might be and the master plan from a designer point of view, but actually the process of getting it to happen seems to be much further behind. And of course it's very much militated against because you're very democratic in many ways. We of course, whether we like it or not, we've got the concept of things like public-private partnerships, <coughs> development corporations where you put the guy <coughs> and give him the responsibility and say, get on and do it. And I think some of your big sites are going to need visions like that, as well as design visions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Right, we have a discussion overview, we've called it. We're running late, but never mind. Um, perhaps we could start with uh, 
uh, that the initial ideas that we talked about this morning, the concepts of the place and city, and uh, relate that back to some of the uh, uh, words that uh, Hans Stiemann um, talked about, uh, uh, mentioned. And uh, c coming a bit more into the realm of uh, the built fabric, or the invisible fabric, in fact, as, as John's been talking about, and how that might affect um, the way that we think about our cities, whether it's in corridors and nodes, or whether it's uh, in uh, uh, circular and cent centralistic uh, 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 manners. Would anybody like to, to start that conversation? Chris. Uh, would you like to come up here, or should we have? Okay. I think the, the well, let me say, first, Berlin actually has 3.2 million, no? million uh, people living in Berlin. And London is, oh, I don't know what's London. Paris, 10 million. So uh, the, the problems from Paris and the problems from London are not the, the same problem from Berlin. We, we have, uh, I think, a small city in relationship to, uh, to London and to Paris. First, second, we, uh, we have in, in East Berlin, they, they, they don't have offices. They, they, they have a, um, a status from 1928. And in, in in West Berlin, we have we don't have offices too, normal offices like in Hamburg. We have a status from 1950. So, uh, what we do actually is to bring Berlin to a normal city in the next 10 years. So it's nothing to do with your problems. First, second, Germany is not uh, England and not uh, France. We have. We have uh, Berlin is now the capital of uh, of uh, Germany, the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, but it's not the the, the finance uh, 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 the headquarter of the financing system is in Frankfurt. It's, we have different uh, big cities in the region in the German uh, country. They are they have their own life and their own centrality. Uh, for instance, Hamburg or Munich or Stuttgart or Düsseldorf. So it's a totally different system from, uh, let's say, from uh, your country and from Paris. So I, I hope we, we don't, we, we get 
be a problem in the future. So I feel very, when I see your, your pictures and your problems, I feel, I think sometimes it's very strange what you're thinking about. <laughs> we, we try to, to get investors within the city and uh, maybe we have your problems in uh, 15 or 20 years, but actually we don't have your problem. We have absolute it seems it seems that we that are a lot of in investors are interested in coming to Berlin. But if you look uh, behind the uh, I don't know what the forehand, <laughs> you see there's a lot of a lot of uh, it's a lot of project on the paper. It's not, they are waiting to uh, for, for the moment the central government uh, comes over to to Berlin and needs another let's say 10 years. And 10 years is a l very long distance in a, uh, uh, from, from the point of private investment to, to, to wait 10 years. And, and, it, uh, and it may be in five or six or eight years, we the first uh, ministries come over to Berlin. And uh, that is the starting point for the fr private economy, too. So. I, when I, I see your, your, your strat new strategy, uh, not a central, uh, more on a corridor, I, I feel like in a seminar in the, in the 50s or in the 60s, it's thinking, the way of thinking, it's, it's very, very, it has a lot of distance to our way of thinking. I, I, I think you, 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 you're just uh, on the beginning point of uh, making bi big mistakes. Uh, <laughs> it, or the, the way of thinking uh, from corridor or from from uh, from uh, central is is a way of the, the point of uh, the the aeroplane, and I, I think it's not the right uh, point of view to talk about this, uh, the cities. And also, I'm I'm very interested in uh, in the, the 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 changing of the office. Uh, sort of uh, working, but at least I feel that the uh, uh, um, Palais in, in, in Venice or an old building in Paris and an old building in, in Berlin, uh, 150 years old, is, is able to fill up all this uh, sort of uh, working. So I think the idea, the general idea, your general idea, that, is there, that there is a relationship between the, the way of working and the, the art, the, uh, how the, the, the city is organized, I think that's a mistake in, in, in general thinking. So I feel, therefore I am very conservative in, in, in thinking about city growing and uh, uh, urban design. I think a city is a city, 2,000 years, and I hope another 1,000 years in Europe, and we need houses big houses, small houses, and we need streets, uh, places, and food passes, and trees, and all the things you, you have in, uh, in our European history. And all this, the thinking, and if, if you, your pictures, uh, I, I don't saw one uh, picture was uh, friendly pi picture, absolute, uh, absolutely ugly, ugly, uh, ugly images from, uh, from the city. And uh, my idea is to go back to to what has shown to to so, and that what we try to do in uh, to do to do in Berlin in the inner city and that what we try to do in uh, Berlin outside the city we go back to the to this uh, 19th century too not in in, uh, in the econo economy not in, in the uh, in the architecture but in the way how the the, the cities are or the suburbs are organized with, with houses, and what, what I am interested uh, in, in, in discuss about how big uh, how big should uh, how, could, a, could a house be within the city, and we think that the, the, the biggest house is a block. That's what I said. So, and more than a block is uh, it's not compatible to a European city. And a block in Berlin is mean uh, 25,000 square meters offices. And if there is an, 
uh, in the company you, you, you need uh, 100,000, it is, it is not uh, uh, compatible to a European city. So the, the, the company has to think about how, uh, how to reorganize his own work. And I think the big companies, they are just on, on the way to, do, to think about their own inner organiz organization. I think it's what not, not an answer to your question, but... Well, briefly, I'd just like to take the discussion back to um, urban design and transport policy, because I think the vision you evoked uh, for Berlin in, in spatial terms is one which members of this group have every sympathy and support for. And if I could relate that to what Kelvin Campbell had to say, and Kelvin made a number of interesting points, but I don't think it was a balance picture of some of the transport policies in London. Um, if, if I could give a couple of examples of, uh, towards the east end of London, um, the, the traffic seems to have been going on, are uh, causing huge damage. I'm speaking about the so-called improvements to the April 13 line has been a lot of the transport infrastructure going on the Royal Docks, which is causing huge separate problems with boroughs around it. It's exactly true. We were having a map today with the red marks showing us where the damage was being created, similar to your map. Uh, of and these are exactly the project I think we've been marking on it. Um, in comparison to that, the city of London, which is the sort of map we were looking at earlier on, uh, shared by Alan Balfour, the city is having a, a, a program now to danger 
Yeah. 
journey as a, if they are a Coca-Cola and they get Coca-Cola. The, the idea from, from, uh, from our idea was the Euro European city, the idea from so many American cities, they don't want to they 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 want to But you have the final um, word of the not, planning, don't you? Did it? You have the final uh, say, yes or no, uh, <coughs> the no, 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 no. If you are that owner in Germany, Thank you. 